forward. Now there are two different circuits in the cardiovascular system. There is the pulmonary circuit that is supplied by the right side of the heart. Blood that's coming from the heart, from the right ventricle, goes into the lungs, allows for that, sorry, we, uh, that uh, exchange. So losing CO2, picking up fresh oxygen, and then it's gonna go back to the left side of the heart. So that is considered the pulmonary circulation of the pulmonary circuit. There was also the systemic circuit. That is basically everything else. So when blood leaves the left side of the heart, the left ventricle, it's gonna to go to all of our tissues, both up and down. So it's gonna to go to our brain, to our upper limbs, to our abdomen, to our thorax, to our legs, to our um, urinary system, our reproductive system, just everywhere else except the lungs. And that is the general circulation or the systemic circulation. Okay, so that is where blood goes after it leaves the left side of the heart and before it makes its way back to the right side of the heart. Now, there are two descriptions for flow through the cardiovascular system. There is a series flow and then there is a parallel flow. So the series flow is what happens when blood moves through the entire cardiovascular system. And series just means that it has to take a stop at each one of those locations. So when blood leaves the heart, it has to go to the systemic circulation. It has to go to the, um, the, the right side of the heart. It has to go to the pulmonary circulation and then has to go back to the left side of the heart. So blood has to make all of those stops. All of the blood has to do that. That is called the series circulation. Alternatively, there is the parallel flow or parallel circulation. This is where blood has an option. So within the systemic circulation, all of the blood doesn't go to the liver. All of the blood doesn't go to the brain. Like it has an option. Some of the blood goes to the liver. Some of it goes to the brain. Some of it goes to the upper extremities. Some of it goes to the lower extremities. Um, same thing with the pulmonary circulation. Within the pulmonary circulation, all of it doesn't go to the left and then all of it goes to the right. That's not what happens. Some of it can go to the right lung and some of it can go to the left lung. And so in this way, the blood has an option and we call this parallel flow, okay? So just to re-explain or we are uh, um, just revisiting that here again, this is something that students often find confusing. So I'm just kind of illustrating it here in a way that makes a little bit more sense. So the general cardiovascular circulation is considered series because when blood leaves the lungs, it must go back to the heart, all of it, okay? Um, this is the left side of the heart via the pulmonary veins. Um, from the left side of the heart, it must go out to the body. All of it must leave via the arteries and all of it must go out to the body. Um, from the entire body, it must come back to the heart via the veins. It, all of it must congregate into a vein. All of it must return to the right atrium and all of it must come back to the right side of the heart. Once again, all of it must go back to the lungs. So this is not an option here. This is series because all of the blood must take all of these four steps, the lungs, to the heart, to the body, back to the heart, to the lungs, okay? Um, converse or alternatively, we have parallel flow and parallel flow exists within the systemic circulation. It also exists within the pulmonary circulation. This is where blood has an option. All of it doesn't go in one direction. Some of the blood goes to the left lung, some of the blood goes to the right lung and that is considered parallel flow. Same thing with the systemic circulation. Some of the blood goes to the liver, some of it goes to the kidneys, some of it goes to the limbs, to the bladder, to the brain. A percentage of that circulation goes to each of our systemic organs respectively, and that is considered parallel flow because that blood has an option in terms of what organ system it's going to go to. Okay, um, any questions on this? Any clarifying questions? Any um, miscon... miscon um, uh, I'm losing my train of thought here, I apologize. Um, any confusions, what I'm trying to say on this topic? Huge brain fart there. All right. 
Okay, um, so let's keep going here and talk more about these series and this parallel flow. So series we said is the entire cardiovascular system because the system is a closed system. Flow has to go from the systemic to the pulmonary um, and back to the heart. There is no option. There is no uh, opportunity to decide if it goes to the heart, it has to go to the heart, has to go to the systemic circulation, has to go back to the heart, has to go to the lungs. Okay, so blood must flow through both circuits in sequence, in series, before returning to its starting point. Parallel flow is where flow is independent. It's regulated to different organs. So we can have blood leaving the heart, going to the brain, to the GI, to the liver, to the kidneys, to the skeletal muscle, to the skin, to the fat and other tissues. This is parallel flow from the arteries to the arterioles, to the capillaries, there is then a choice about where that blood can go and how much percentage of that blood goes to each of these organs. So if you're exercising, if you're undergoing physical activity or strenuous activity, more of your blood will be shunted to your heart, less of it will be shunted to your GI. And so that's gonna be more of that uh, independent regulation of flow to allow more oxygen to be delivered to your heart. Okay, alternatively, alternatively, if you're having a large meal, if you're relaxing, you're in that uh, rest or digest state, you have blood shunted away from your heart and towards the GI tract, towards the liver to allow for absorption of those nutrients, etc. Now, we also want to think about the coronary circulation. Um, just to jump back here and point that out as well, the coronary circulation is a part of the parallel flow because the coronary circulation is actually on the outside of the heart. And so it would be tempting to believe that the heart kind of just takes oxygen from the blood that's circulating within the chambers, but that is not true. The way that the heart gets its oxygen and eliminates its waste is through the coronary circulation. So there are these vessels that are running on the outside of the heart. They are um, individually named and branched. So there's the left coronary artery giving blood to the left part of the heart. There's the right coronary artery giving blood to the right side of the heart. Um, and then there are veins that are running on the heart as well. The coronary um, circulation has veins as well. And so this is considered parallel because some of the blood goes to the heart in this fashion as well. Not all of the blood, but some of the blood goes to the coronary circulation and gives blood to the heart muscle and removes the waste that's coming from that from those cells as well. The blood in the chambers does not supply the nutrients and the oxygen does not eliminate the waste from the cardiac myocytes from the cardiac cells, okay? It is just acting as a reservoir and as a pump to move that blood around, whereas the coronary circulation is how the heart can receive its blood. It's got its own set of capillary network, capillary beds, and that is how we can um, give the blood its oxygen and eliminate waste, all right? Now, these vessels, come right off the base of the aorta. So here's the aorta, leaving the left ventricle. These two vessels, the left coronary and the right coronary, both come off of the base of the aorta. And so you can say that the heart is a bit selfish in this way. It takes the first bit of blood that's coming off from the very first artery. And so it kind of got it's, it's, it kind of has dibs on the, the fresh oxygen, if you will, right? It's going to take it right out from that first artery and it's going to start supplying it to that coronary um, circulation so you can get the first bit of oxygen that's coming out from that first vessel. All right. Um, now, talking about the way the heart is located, some of the general surface anatomy here, it's within the center, center excuse me, of the thoracic cavity. It is being separated from the abdominal region by the diaphragm, so it's kind of sitting on top of the diaphragm. Um, it is also being bordered by the left and right lungs, so it's sitting right in the center of left and right lungs. Um, and then the posterior boundary is going to be the vertebral column that we would have talked about. The anterior boundary is going to be the sternum that we would have also talked about. So the heart is really nestled in this really tight, confined space, and it is slightly askew to the left. So it's kind of slightly leaning to the left, um, where it dips more into the space or invades more of the space of the left lung. It's usually the size of a fist, and that is corresponding to that person's size. 
your body weight, your body habitus. So if you're really large and really tall, you'll likely have a larger fist, you'll therefore likely have a larger heart. If you're really small and petite, you'll also have a smaller fist and therefore a smaller heart. Um, usually women have smaller hearts just by nature of being slightly smaller, muscles being smaller in general, and men have slightly larger hearts. The heart weighs about 250 to 350 grams in its normal state. Um, and that is gonna be for an adult heart. Obviously children's hearts are sometimes, um, are usually rather much smaller than that. The heart is encaptured by the uh, pericardium. It is a sac that surrounds the heart. There is a very thin layer in between that sac that has a small amount of fluid called pericardial fluid or serous fluid. And that helps to lubricate and decrease any friction as those chambers move. So as the atria expand to accommodate volume, as the ventricles contract to squeeze that volume out, there is mobility, there is movement to the muscle of the heart. And so to lubricate that movement and to reduce any friction, there is that small amount of fluid within the layers of the pericardium. Okay, let's talk about the three internal layers of the heart wall itself. So we're looking at a nice uh, cross section here. We can see the thick left ventricle and the thinner right ventricle wall. Um, so the three layers of the heart from the outer to the inner are the epicardium, epi meaning outer or above. This is the external membrane. The myocardium, which is the thickest part of this wall, of this, uh, this wall. This is the actual cardiac muscle, right? This is that thick, cardiac muscle that makes up the myocardium. And then the inner layer is the endothelium, which is really a layer of endothelial cells, okay? And so in this way, we'll see when we talk about the vasculature next semester or in the summer here, um, we'll see that the heart is really a giant blood vessel. It has the same three layers in the same orientation, and it's got the same configuration of a vessel of an artery. And so it just is larger in terms of the structure but it's just a giant vessel in that regard, okay? And as I pointed out before, the left ventricle has a much thicker wall. The left ventricle has to pump blood out to the entire systemic circulation. So that's your head, your limbs, your abdomen, your brain. And so it has to undergo uh, one, more resistance that's encountered in, that, in those vessels, but two, it has a longer way to go. That blood has a much further distance to travel, and so there's more force that's needed to eject the blood from the left heart, and so the left ventricle wall is usually substantially thicker than the right ventricle wall. The right ventricle only has to pump to the pulmonary circulation, so into the pulmonary artery and out to both lungs and then right back into the, to the left side of the heart. And so it's a shorter distance to go, so it's less force needed. It's also less resistance encountered in those larger pulmonary vessels. Okay. Um, talking more here about valves, so we introduced this idea that valves are needed to keep blood moving unidirectionally. Um, the pressure in our chambers is going to change with the heart cycle, which we'll talk about um, in our future packets. And so the pressure difference across these valves is what drives blood flow. So blood is always moving from high pressure to low pressure, okay? And so it would be tempting, again here, to think that the valves are opening because of some contractile force. They're not. The valves are purely passive. And so what's keeping them closed is the fact that the pressure is not high enough to open them. When the pressure in the preceding chamber becomes higher than the pressure in the subsequent chamber, that is what will passively swing that valve open. And then when the pressure gets lower than the preceding chamber, that valve will shut again, okay? So this is what keeps blood moving from atria to ventricle and then from ventricle to arteries, and the opening of the valve is due to the pressure gradient. Is a passive opening that is due to a pressure gradient. Alrighty. And the analogy that I like to give here is if you were to think about a door, right? If you had a swing door that would swing open only when you pushed on it, that is the same thing with our valves. It is not a mechanical door, right? Mechanical doors will open and close with their own ability. 
So that is not what we see here. The heart, the heart valves are not contractile. They don't have muscle. They don't contract and move of their own will. They only move when the pressure of the blood in the preceding chamber is enough to exert some force that they can swing open. And then when the pressure is lower, those valves will passively shut once again. Okay, so very similar to swinging doors that only move when you, when you have enough force or push being exerted on them. All right, let's talk about the names of our different valves. So we have atrioventricular valves, sometimes called AV valves. These separate atria from ventricle. So the AV valves are bicuspid on the right, so separating the right atrium from the right ventricle is the tricuspid valve. It has three cusps, and that is to help provide extra um, security with preventing any backflow because the right side of the heart is more of the volume side of the heart. More of that volume coming back from all of the circulatory system comes back to the right side of the heart. We need an extra leaflet here to really provide a tight seal under the, um, the high volume of blood that's coming back. So the left side of the heart is more the pressure side of the heart. The right side of the heart is more the volume side of the heart. Okay. On the left side, the AV valve is called the bicuspid valve. It only has two cusps or two leaflets. This is also called the mitral valve because it looks like the bishop's hat, which is in mitre. And so that is the analogy that's given by calling this a mitral valve. There are also additional structures that help to keep the valves from prolapsing. These are the papillary muscles. So these upward finger-like projections that we're seeing here that are attaching to the corda tendinae, these, corda, these tendinous cords, um, these are the papillary muscles. So these muscles that are sticking up, the fibrous cords that are attaching to the valves are the corda tendinae. And both of these structures work together to prevent the leaflets from prolapsing. And prolapsing just means that they're, kind of, that they're gonna kind of fly back into the preceding chamber and that's not what we want. So we wanna keep them nice and patent, nice and uh, flat, and there may be high pressure in the ventricle. So when the ventricle starts contracting, there may be this propensity for the pressure there to push that valve back up into the atria. And to avoid that, we have these cords these corda tendinae or tendinous cords that are anchored to the papillary muscle that help to keep the cords nice and tight and, and patent and keep the leaflets um, taut, if you will, and prevent them from prolapsing back into the atria. All right. So here is the relaxed vent ventricle where the uh, valve is open and the cords are kind of pulling down to open that valve. Here is the contracted uh, papillary muscle. So when the chamber is contracting, the papillary mus muscle contracts, the corda tendinae pulls up and it kind of just anchors the valve to keep them nice and tight without preventing, without allowing them to go back up into the atria under the force of that contracting ventricle. All right, okay. Um, moving on to the other set of valves. So these are the semilunar valves. And the semilunar valves are located between the, uh, the ventricles and the artery. So on the right, it's between the right ventricle and the pulmonary artery. This is the pulmo pulmonary or pulmonic valve. On the left, it's between the left ventricle and the aorta. This is the aortic valve. Okay, um, and these are both called semilunar valves. They're shaped in that semilunar uh, type of fashion, and they're preventing blood from going from the artery back down into the ventricle. Okay, so here's that semilunar configuration here, kind of like a, a moon, if you will, or a half moon there. Um, and during the uh, contracted state of the ventricle, we want blood to be leaving, so we're going to have them open. Um, during the relaxing state of that ventricle when we're filling blood from the atria. So as blood fills down from the atria, we wanna keep these semilunar valves closed and allow for the filling to adequately happen before we can allow for ejection, okay? So all this is happening in stages or phases in mean, the cycle that we'll talk about coming up where the ventricle must fill first, this is when the semilunar valves are closed, but the AV valves are open, and then it will eject. During ejection, the AV valves are closed and the semilunar valves are open. 